Greetings, true believers, and welcome to another episode of Dan Dashley Discusses, the weekly web show where I talk to you about a comic book, tell you if you should buy it, borrow it, or skip it. It's a relatively simple format. I'm a simple man. That's all there is to it. Let's get right on with the review. This week, we are talking about The Spire by Boom Studios. It is the work of Simon Spurrier, as well as, on art, Jeff Stokely. Spurrier and Stokely are no strangers to one another. They had both worked on one of my favorite books of the past few years, which is Six Gun Gorilla. For those of you unfamiliar with Six Gun Gorilla, it is basically exactly what it sounds and looks like. Spurrier and Stokely captured my heart at that point. So when I had heard that they were coming out with a new book called The Spire, I was all for it, and here we are. The Spire takes place in an urban fantasy-style environment, I guess is the best word for it. There's a lot of fantasy elements, and of course there's this big, sprawling, vertical city known as the Spire, which is where a majority of the book takes place. Spurrier and Stokely take every opportunity to set up the world outside of the Spire, just as much as they set up this actual sprawling cityscape. The truth of the matter is, there's all these different settings, and we know very little about any of them. In this book, we follow the captain of the City Watch of the Spire by the name of Shaw. She is a sort of genetically altered sort of human being, which is sort of the way that they're, they're presenting it to us. Uh, I'll get a little deeper into that later, but this book sort of follows her story as captain of the guard dealing with murders, dealing with a baroness of the spire taking over and dealing with her own personal and societal issues. Our first introduction to her is rather dramatic actually. She's chasing these sort of Shakespearean Elizabethan style gang members is basically what they are. Uh, and we see a lot of the cityscape in this, so it's a rather informative introduction in that sense. And we do get a lot of the personality of the people living in the cityscape through the, how they react to this chase and how the gang members are doing what they're doing. And as these type of things go, they end up getting away, later getting murdered, and that sort of spurs off this whole large mystery that Shaw is presented with as the book goes on. I'm actually not going to go too deep into the plot of this spire because there's other things that I want to talk about with this book. First and foremost, there's really the pacing that I wanted to discuss. It has, and I say this for a lot of books, it has a really breakneck pace. Spurrier is sort of throwing the entire world at us at once. It's not shocking given that this is an eight page limited series, so we don't exactly have time to be pussyfooting around the universe, the people, and the setting. But at some times, this book is a really overwhelming read for an issue one. I personally happen to really like that. There was so much going on that I was thinking to myself, who's that? What do they want? You know, all the different questions when you're first introduced to a concept, you ask those with the spire about 90 times, just in these first 31 pages. In the book, we're discussing things like classism between the people living on the higher rung of the spire and the lower rung of the spire. Racism with Shah's race, or I guess type of people, they're called the sculpted or the skews or about a million other names for these sort of genetically altered super beings is what I'm gathering from it, that they're genetically altered. That's most likely magic given the setting. Two issues about sexuality. Shaw happens to be a lesbian and that's really brought up quite well and some of the issues discussed are really subtle and in the background. That's a thing that I do give this book a lot of credit for. A lot of other books would be very in your face about, hey, we have a main character that's a lesbian, check out this. Spurrier is really pulled back with that. Shaw just happens to be a lesbian, and we meet her lover in this issue. And it comes up once, maybe twice, um, that, that Shaw is a lesbian, but it's not made the main focus. Shaw has a lot of character outside of that, and I feel that's what's important with establishing a relationship like that in a comic book, and not having it be a novelty like some other writers would like to do. Then on top of that, we've got issues like Royal Ascension, with the Baroness taking over for her father almost immediately, after he dies, which is sort of turning a lot of heads in the city. It's a combination of a lot of different messages and issues all being brought up at once and sort of just thrusted at you, almost like it was shot out of a shotgun in your face. If you're standing too close, you're going to want to brace for the impact because if you're not ready, it will knock you on your ass and you're probably not going to read this book. But it does make for a lot of mystery and a lot of questioning that draws the reader in. Because so much is being given to us all at once, the things that you're interested in, you're going to be very interested in. You want to know what happened that made the sculpted what they are. You want to know what these little flying dudes delivering messages are. You want to know why there's so much classism in the spire. These are all things that Spurrier does a good job of presenting to the audience as things that we want to naturally find out about. In addition to that, Spurrier manages to create a very colorful cast of characters. From our main character Shah herself, to her lover Mera, to the Baroness, 
to even these sort of old English pickpockets. They all managed to draw me in at least one way or the other. And it's really that colorful cast of characters, this bright, vibrant universe that he's created, and the decently subtle way that Spurrier is bringing up all of these issues. That's why you don't mind too much when there's these obvious social messages that are being brought up in the book. Because you care about the characters and because you care about the settings, you get invested in some of these issues yourself. And that's really the key here, and that's what makes Spurrier a phenomenal writer on this book. I will say that as an author, Spurrier does like to mix a lot of things into his pot. Six Gun Gorilla had sort of a future western thing going on. This is an urban fantasy. It's just a common trait that he does. So if you don't like the mixing of genres, the Spire, much like Six Gun Gorilla, probably will not be for you. I want to move on to the art in this book. Jeff Stockley does a phenomenal job of bringing this weird universe to life. And I say weird because we've got dudes that are looking like sort of trees, guys looking like the offsprings of one of those troll dolls and a tooth fairy. We've got people like Shah herself that have these sort of odd powers coming out that are manifesting in a really interesting way, but it's not just the fantastical weird things that Stokely does a great job of presenting. The Spire is such a large, expansive area, and Stokely does a really good job of bringing it to life. Slums are gross and slimy and dirty, and you obviously can tell that you wouldn't want to be there. The people that are down on their luck in the lower levels of the Spire, they're wearing things that are basically potato sacks. Meanwhile, the people in the upper levels are wearing high-class clothes. It's the little subtle things like this that really bring the Spire to life and have us able to relate our own world to the world of the Spire. On top of that, Stokely manages to make the differences between places like the Spire, the Nothing Land, and all the other different fantasy settings instantly recognizable between each other. There was no point in which I was confusing anything for the Spire. It's obvious what was the Spire and what was not, and that's an important thing for keeping us invested and interested in the story. At the same time, while there is all this weird imagery going on, Stokely manages to still make it attractive to us. There's no point in which something is so gross and so misshapen and so out of proportion that you'd put the book down. Everything follows normal conventions that we expect to see, but adding interesting twists that make them enjoyable. Things aren't weird and gross because Stokely can't draw them well. They're weird and gross because Stokely wanted us to think they were weird and gross. That's an important distinction, and some artists can't do it. On top of Stokely's amazing, amazing penciling and line work, we have Andre May bringing some of the most vibrant colors I have seen on a book Hell, I'm going to say it, since Six Gun Gorilla. The vibrant blues, the vibrant pinks, we see all of that here. And on top of that, this decision to make Shaw's tendrils a bright, bright white is simply out of this world. It makes them instantly recognizable. We tie the color with the color of her hair, which is also white, and she's the only person that we see with these color combinations. It gives her a striking profile. You can pick her out of a lineup immediately. One thing that I also love is Stokely isn't afraid to make panel transitions a part of the story and part of the normal transitions. I'm going to bring up a scene right here, which is where we see Shaw going through the different levels of the spire. And these panel transitions are some of my favorite in recent memory. However, I will say the art isn't always phenomenal. Sometimes some background faces get a little muddled, and that's common among artists, but it still isn't exactly the best thing to see. And there just are some instances in which if you're not willing to put aside some of the stylistic choices that Stokely has made with faces in general, with body shapes, you're not going to be able to enjoy it fully. One thing I'm going to add, which is separate from really the art and the writing, is Steve Wand on letters. Steve Wand, for those of you who don't know, uh, name a comic, he probably did lettering for it at some point. Steve Wand is an old pro, and in this book, he did an amazing thing, which is where we had dialogue that was obviously whispered or said snarkily or said under someone's breath. And what he did with that, instead of making it black and upfront with us, he made it gray and sort of almost in the back, depth-wise. We could really tell when someone was being a snarky asshole in the spire, or someone was saying something vaguely racist, or something along those lines. It's little choices like that that really separate the lettering in this book from just generic good lettering. Steve Wand, he's a master of the craft, and he always puts his best foot forward. The spire is no exception. So we come to the end here. What does spire represent as a whole package? On the one hand, we have an interesting world created by a great author, combined with one of the best artists in the business and some of the best coloring that we've seen in a long while. However, The Spire is a limited series. 
this is the first of eight issues. That brings up some interesting challenges. First and foremost, with a limited series like this, there's the chance that the pacing is going to feel rather rushed and fast. I give Spurrier full credit in thinking that he's able to make it drawn out enough so that the plot is given to us in a normal fashion and we don't feel the plot speed. But with just eight issues, it's almost a given that certain parts are going to feel fast or untouched on. That's a natural thing. However, Spurrier has planned this book to be this many issues. He's a big enough name that I'm sure Boom would give him however many issues he wanted. So really regardless of how you feel about it, I'm sure the plot speed is going to go the exact amount that Spurrier wanted. At the same time, after eight, maybe nine months of reading The Spire and you bought every issue, boom, the trade's going to come out. A lot of people don't like to buy floppies and then buy the trade. Why would you buy the same comic twice? It only makes sense. So naturally at this point, you're thinking I'm going to most likely give it a borrow it. So you just simply wait for the trade, that this book is good, and you should certainly get the trade as soon as it comes out, and until then, borrow the copies from someone else. <laughs> but I am actually going to say the Spire, as of right now, is worth sinking money into the floppies. On top of being a good book, Boom tends to be a little slower than some of the larger companies on the delivery of their trades. So you'll collect all of this book, and honestly, you could still be waiting three, four months for the trade to come out. I'm going to call to mind the Steven Universe comic for this one. The trade for that still isn't out. The quality of the Spire, combined with the fact that you still might be waiting on the trade for a while, means I'm going to give the Spire a buy it. I think everyone needs to read this comic right now as it's coming out. We need to send a message to Boom saying, hey, print more stuff like this. And Boom is usually a company that's willing to listen. So go ahead, go out to your local comic book shop, go to Amazon, wherever you buy your comics, pick up a copy of The Spire. So that's all we have for this episode of Dan Dash Discusses, guys. Leave a comment below, tell me if you think this book was worth a buy, to borrow it, to skip it. Remember to follow us on all of our various social media, from our Tumblr to our Twitter to our Facebook to what? Whatever, man. Just do it. Do it all. Who cares? It's one click from you. Helps everybody out. It's all around a good time, right? I mean, you have a good time here. Otherwise, why would you be watching my videos? Remember, if you have a request, put it in the comments below. I'll be happy to get to it, give you a full review of that comic. And tune in tomorrow, because I'm also doing a second review on We Stand Guard, the new Brian K. Vaughan book, which I didn't get to today, because I wanted to talk about the Spire first. Until next time, have a good one, true believers.